Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Welcome to Berean Baptist Church on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. If you, our, our assistant pastor just brought a tremendous message on the rock. And I hope that you were tuned in to hear that because thank God this morning, our faith and our hope is on that rock. Before we pray, I'd like to share with you a passage of scripture. I posted it on my uh, pastor's page on Facebook. Uh, but I want to share it with you this morning as we begin this service on this beautiful resurrection morning. First Peter chapter one, you don't need to turn there. I hope you have your Bibles at home and maybe you're sitting back and watching on TV or internet a live stream or whatever, but um, we're glad that you've joined us. We're glad that you've tuned in and we hope and pray you'll get a blessing this morning. In first Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter one, he writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath be, uh, according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the re, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to tell you this morning, our hope is in that rock that Brother Aaron preached. Our hope this morning is not in the government. Amen. Our hope is not in man. A man will fail you. Uh, our hope is not in the flesh. Our hope this morning is in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. If you will bow your heads with me, <clears throat> I would appreciate that. Father, this morning we come to the throne of grace. And Lord, we are... We're rejoicing. Uh, we have a hope that will never fail, uh, Father, because we have a God that will never fail us. And Lord, we come this morning to exalt and worship and praise a living Savior. And we pray, God, this morning that those who are listening in, watching, whatever it might be the case, oh God, I pray this morning, if they do not know the resurrected Christ, that before these services are over, great Sunday school lesson. And now, Lord, as I try to bring God's word, that Father, the Holy Spirit will speak. And may this morning, if they have no hope, they will turn to Jesus, who is the only hope. Bless now, we pray, thy word. Hide me behind the cross. God, give me power and unction, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, if you will, and turn to uh, Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew 27. I want to direct your attention, if I might, to verse 62. Matthew 27, verse 62. The Bible says, Now the next day <clears throat> that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that thou, that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the scepter be made sure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. You'll find from the very first resurrection morning, some 2,000 years ago, under this very hour in which I stand before you, there have been those who have doubted, discredited, and denied the literal bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You find the scripture that I just read here in Matthew, uh, from the very onset, the Roman government, 
did everything within its power that it could do to keep people from believing that Jesus had risen from the dead. If you notice what it says there, uh, oh, uh, he said, go seal the tomb and make it as sure as you can. Well, praise God, they could not make it sure enough to keep Jesus in the grave. Hallelujah. Even his disciples, <clears throat> I want to share something with you here. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, you need to see the word of God on this. In Mark chapter 16, uh, <clears throat> verse 62, even his disciples doubted the resurrection of Jesus. I don't think they doubted long, but they had a period of doubt. You say, no, they didn't. Oh, yes, they did. Uh, look at my, uh, Mark 16 and verse 62, if you if you got your Bibles uh, here in uh, on it. Excuse me. Uh, verse 5, Mark 16, verse 5. I'm sorry. Uh, I want you to read this. So I want to read this to you. Mark 16, verse 5. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He was. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they, <clears throat> for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that he had been, had been with him as they mourned and wept. Now look at verse 11. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. He's not talking to the Roman government there. He's not talking to Pilate there. He's not talking to that crowd that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. No, these words were spoken to his inner circle, uh, his disciples. And notice, after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country and went and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. You see, the doctrine, the belief, in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it has been discussed, disputed, and denied down through the ages. Satan has taken the doctrine of the, of the resurrection and he has completely distorted it as he has, as he has almost done with everything that we as Christians believe. For instance, he is, he is really attempting to destroy the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How? Well, he's turned it into a pagan holiday. Uh, they're calling it Easter. And, he put, and the focus this morning for most of the world is not on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you hear me this morning, it's on baby chickens, rabbits, eggs, Easter baskets, candy, and so forth. Oh, listen, that is not what Easter is all about. Amen. Easter is about the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to me, it is the foundation of everything we as fundamental Bible-believing Baptists believe that the, the resurrection is the, the heart of every thing that we believe. You see, the virgin birth of Christ, His virtuous life, His vicarious blood atonement, 
His voluntary sacrificial death on the cross. None of those things would have any meaning whatsoever if Christ had not risen from the dead. You see, it is that, listen to me this morning. Brother Aaron touched on this. He and I sometimes cross. He, he, uh, God gives him things that God gave me, and, and we talk about it, and, and you need a double dose. And you listen to this this morning. It is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ that sets the Christian or Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Amen. Every religion has its prophet and leader, but so do we. Every religious movement has their sacred book, and so do we. Every religious movement has their doctrines, and so do we. But hallelujah this morning, there is one basic difference between the two, and that is our faith is founded upon a resurrected and living Savior. And you hear me this morning, no cult or, no, or, or any other religion can make that claim. Amen. Go to the burial place of Buddha. His bones are still there. Go to the grave of Confucius. His bones are still there. And most of all this morning, go to the burial plot of Muhammad. And I'll tell you this morning, his bones are still decaying in that grave. But all this morning, let me take you to a tomb on a hillside just outside the city of Jerusalem. Let me take you there this morning. And I've been there. Let me take you inside that tomb. The first thing you notice is the stone has been removed. You'll go into that tomb and the, the hewn out place where the body lay is there. I've seen it for myself. And you turn and look and hallelujah, all of a sudden it comes over you as it never comes before. He is not there for he rose from the dead. Amen. An empty tomb. And no religion, no cult, no false doctrine can ever say that. But hallelujah this morning, we who believe in Jesus Christ have a faith and we can say that. Amen. Because he's not there uh, on it there. <clears throat> you see Paul himself. Now here's where we're going to land this morning. Paul himself. Turn with me to the 15th chapter of Corinthians. Paul himself encountered those who doubted the resurrection, even back in his day. In fact, some were in the church. Because what I'm going to read is written to the church at Corinth. Now, that doesn't mean everybody in, in a church is saved. Uh, I wish that I could say everybody at Berean uh, who comes to Berea and is saved. I can't say that. But be that as it may, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians, if you will, and I want you to notice uh, some questioning the validity of the resurrection. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, if you will, first of all. I want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians 1, 12. It says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm Paul, I'm Apollos, and I'm Cephas, and I'm Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. And he said, I thank God that I uh, <clears throat> did not baptize any of you. And he goes on, again, like brother, for a brevity of time, he's, uh, Paul says this in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. Now, Paul had laid it out why God had sent him, and he had been, to, he had been at, uh, no doubt, at the church of Corinth at one time or another, and had preached unto them on it. 
But now turn, if you will, to chapter 15. Here's where you find. Paul had laid out that he was, he was to preach the gospel of the resurrected Christ. Now, in verse 15 and uh, verse, uh, uh, chapter 15, excuse me, and verse 13, he, this is to the church. It says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised. But look at verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, if, 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 that's, if he's being preached that, how say some of you in the church, how say some of you, among, uh, some among you, not all of them, some among them, how say you, listen to this, they were disputing, they were saying, there is no resurrection of the dead. But look at verse 13. He says in verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Listen, folks. If there has, had been no resurrection, if Jesus Christ this morning is still in that tomb outside of Jerusalem where his remains are still there, if they were, then I want to say to you this morning, Everything that you believe and I believe would be of no avail whatsoever. If you doubt the resurrection, you hear me? If you doubt the resurrection, then you do not believe in anything that we preach and we believe. Now, Paul counteracts this uh, uh, doubting. If you, I want you to, we're going to look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And you find here, he mentions in the following verses, some things that are absolutely, totally, completely dependent upon the truth that Jesus rose from the dead there. And, and he, he, he reacts to it this way. In, in sort of in a negative thing, because he he, he asserts that the, these things would not be possible if Christ had not risen. So I want to, if I title my message this morning, it is the title, What If? I share with you this morning, what if? What if Christ has not risen. What if he's still in that tomb? Or what if, as the Roman government tried to, uh, to uh, accuse, what if his disciples had came and stolen the body and buried it somewhere else? What if he had not really died on the cross and it just sort of, so, there's a theory out there that he swooned and, and he sort of just passed out. But when, uh, when they put him in the tomb, he awoke. Well, by the way, let me say, if that were the case, he couldn't have come out of that tomb anyway. That stone, I've been there. There's no human being could move that stone in front of that tomb. What if? What if Jesus had not risen from the dead. What will be and what is this morning the result of that question? I want to point, I want to use this what if he had not risen from the dead. Then Paul answers that question. I believe you'll get a blessing from this. You find first of all, if Christ had not risen from the dead, our message would be meaningless. If Christ had not risen from the dead, you hear me this morning, we would have no message to preach to a lost and dying world. Let's notice what it says. Verse 15. Look at verse 14. We're just going to take it right down the line here. Here's what he says, very plain. First, uh, First Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if, if Christ be not risen, 
then is our preaching vain. Now, this word vain simply means to be empty, to be useless, or futile. In other words, if Christ be not risen from the dead, our preaching is without any power or authority whatsoever. You see, our listen, the gospel, the message that we preach to a lost and dying world, that gospel that Paul preached, if it was if we do not have a risen Christ, a living Lord, then you hear me this morning. That message is absolutely worthless. It has no power or no authority. You see, Paul writes in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, there. And he says, To everyone that believeth, to the Jew and the Gentile, and so forth. Now listen, folks. The power of the gospel lies in the message of a living Christ. If, if Christ has not risen, this message that I'm trying to preach this morning is absolutely empty, and it's nothing but sounding brass, tinkling cymbals. That's all it would be if Christ had not risen from the dead. Let me say this, no resurrection, no message. You see, the resurrection does three things. The resurrection is a message, or, or, or without the resurrection, I'll give you what it does. Without the resurrection, we have, there is no power to save anyone. You find that, I, I don't have time to read Acts 4, verse 10 and 12. If there's no resurrection, there's no power to save. If there's no resurrection, there's no power to secure. Romans 6, 5. If there's no resurrection, there's no power to satisfy. John 6, 35. That's the problem this morning. This world is out here searching and reaching and, try, and, and grasping for something because they do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, listen this morning. Preaching without preaching the resurrection is pointless. There's no point to it. It's powerless. There's no power in it. And it's profane. It is absolutely wrong uh, to preach a gospel that does not have the resurrection of Jesus Christ in it. Amen. So if Christ be not risen, our message has no meaning none whatsoever but let's go on he writes secondly if there be no resurrection not only is our message not meaningful but our faith is futile let's look look at the latter part of verse 14 and then we'll look at verse 17 i read the first part and if Jesus be not risen, then is our preaching vain, empty, no power, no message, just so much words. But also, if there be no resurrection, our faith is futile. Here's what he says. And your faith is also vain, empty, powerless, worthless. But let's look at verse 17. He says, and, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You see, a message that does not and is not dependent upon the truth of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith like that will be empty and worthless. Now, let me, I want to clarify something. He's not saying faith is vain. He didn't say that. Some people take it that, well, uh, my faith is vain. No, he's not talking about your faith being vain. He's talking about if you place your faith 
in anything else but the risen Christ, that faith is vain. See, I hope you get that uh, on it. Uh, in other words, faith in a dead Christ has no value whatsoever. Worthless at, at, at its best. But let me ask a question this morning. What does faith in a dead Christ accomplish? Absolutely nothing. Think about it. All of these cults, uh, all of these uh, crazy religions in the world, none of them have any reference or any association with Jesus Christ. And think of the untold millions this morning that have put their faith in these false religions and these false gods and these false doctrines. Oh, how tragic that is. They have, they have a faith that is empty, it's vain. They have a faith that will, will accomplish absolutely nothing. You see, everything associated with a Christian life is associated with faith. Did you know that? <laughs> how you mean, preacher? I mean this. We are, first of all, we're saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes that clear. Uh, I don't know how these people who teach that you've got to have, be baptized to be fa uh, saved. You've got to go do the certain works to be saved. You've got to keep certain ordin ordinances to be saved. You've got to light so many candles to be saved. You've got to bow before certain idols to be saved. How do they justify? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Hallelujah. Listen, a faith short of that is a vain faith, an empty faith, and a powerless faith. And I'm going to say, and I say it in love, but it will take you to hell. A faith like that. You see, everything about Christianity is by faith in a, not just faith, but faith in a resurrected, living Christ. So our faith saves us. Not only that, Colossians 2.8, our faith sustains us. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Why is it this morning in this coronavirus epidemic we have? So many are panicking and running around scared. Almost, they're, they're almost afraid to look themselves in the mirror. Just looking at the mirror, seeing themselves, they might get the virus. Why? I'm not saying don't be cautious. I'm not saying do everything you can to keep yourself safe. That's stupid. That's foolish to do that. But I'm saying this morning, the kind of faith that you, you need, if you don't have, is the faith that will carry, as Brother Aaron mentioned, it'll carry you through the storm, and it'll carry you through this uh, coronavirus as well. Amen. On it there. You see, uh, faith will sustain us. We don't have to panic. I, I guess I guess I'm uh, I don't think I'm the only nut, but uh, some people think I'm the only nut. But listen, I've got no fear of this thing whatsoever. None. None. Now, I don't mean I'm going to go out and let somebody breathe on me. That doesn't mean I'm not going to clean my hands every time I I uh, go out or whatever I do. No, no, no. But if, I be, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I follow what I'm supposed to follow, I've got no fear whatsoever. God's going to take care of me. Amen. How do you know, preacher? 
F-A-I-T-H. That's how I know. Faith. Why? I believe God's still on the throne. And where, and where Jesus said, God will take care of His own, I believe God will take care of His own. I can say with confidence this morning, and I say it praising God, praising God. As far as I know, not one member of our church has even got close to having a symptom. We're nothing special. It's not us. But it's our God whom we have faith that will take care of us. Not only that, but in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says we're to be strong in the faith. What good is a faith that is a faith only when the sun shines? Fair weather Christians. We have a almost, a, I'm afraid to say, sometimes a church full of them. As long as everything's going all right, as long as there's nothing that upsets the apple cart, long as there's no storms to face, as long as the sun is shining bright, they stand up and sing, Oh, to God be the glory, victory in Jesus. But let something come down the pike that upsets the apple cart, and you find them panicking and running around, wringing their hands. Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? What's going to be the outcome? Hey, I don't care what the outcome's going to be. God's going to be there when the outcome comes. Amen. So, let me say again. Everything about the Christian life is associated with faith. But it is, a, listen to me, it is a faith in a resurrected living Jesus. It's founded on that. And faith in anything else, faith in anyone else, but a living Christ is a futile faith and it will not see you through. Amen. Oh, he asked the question. <laughs> if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. Your faith is empty. Your faith is worthless. Why? Because that whatever it is you have your faith in besides Jesus will not meet your need. Amen. If he be not risen from the dead. Let's look at the third thing here. If Christ be not risen from the dead, then there would be no salvation from sin. Mark that down. Put that down as a surety. Look at verse 7, if you will. Excuse me, verse 17. Verse 17, I'm sorry. Look what, I'm going down the line here. Verse 17. And if, what if, Christ be not raised? What is, what about it? Well, he said, I, he said, your faith is in vain. But boy, he said something else. To me, that's a lot worse than that. He said, if Christ be not raised, ye are yet in your sin. May I say this morning and say it emphatically that you might get it. Your salvation, if you're saved, my salvation, if I'm saved, is dependent on one thing. What is it? Yeah, you've got to believe, but you've got to believe something. And your salvation is dependent on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and your belief in that resurrection. You say, how do you know, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Turn, turn with me, if you will, to uh, the book of Romans, uh, if you will. Romans chapter 10. I want, I want to prove something to you. Romans. Here we go. Ten. The resurrection is the basis for your salvation. I hope you get this. Uh, I pray to God uh, that you will get it. Uh, there. Romans chapter 10, 
and verse beginning with verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's good, and shalt believe in thine heart, what? Believe the, uh, 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 the Lord? Yes. But you've got to believe something about the Lord, or else this scripture is not true. He says, If thou, uh, uh, thou shalt believe in thine heart, what? That God hath raised him from the dead. Folks, let me be animate here. A dead Christ cannot save you. That's it. That's why Buddha cannot save. Confucius cannot save. Mohammed cannot save. All of uh, uh, Joseph Smith cannot save. Mary Baker Eddy cannot save. Hear me this morning. Only a resurrected living Christ has the power to save us from our sin. Amen. Why? Let's look at it. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now here is a clincher. This is why a church cannot save you. This is why rituals cannot save you. This is why burning candles cannot save you. This is why any a preacher cannot save you. By the way, a priest cannot save you either. Amen. I'll go farther than that. A pope can't save you either. Why? Let's look at it. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference. You're all going to get saved the same way, or you're not going to get saved at all. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Here it is. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you must believe that he rose from the dead and you must believe in a living, resurrected Christ. Amen. You mark that down, if you will, on it there. Oh, listen. Notice what he says here. Well, I'll come to that in a moment uh, uh, there. What I'm saying is this. If Jesus this morning on this, what we call Resurrection Sunday, if He is still in that grave, we are still in our sin. We may be members of Berean Baptist Church. We may even believe the Bible. We may, we may even have called upon Jesus. But, you're saved because He rose victoriously, bodily, out of that tomb 2,000 years ago. Without that, hear me again. Without, Listen, my heart's heavy on this. Without that, there is no salvation whatsoever. Amen. If my, if my Lord is still in that tomb, then I'm on the road to hell as sure as I'm standing here. I say again, a dead Christ, a dead Savior, cannot save anyone whatsoever. But here's the saddest truth of all. He says, if Christ be not risen, death will have the domain. Death will have the domain. Look at verse 18 and 19. But I say, have they, no, I'm in Romans, I apologize. Go back to Corinthians, I apologize for that. I didn't turn my, I didn't turn my Bible back. Look at verse 18 and 19 in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, then they also which are fallen asleep. Now the word sleep 
always is related, and especially when it's related to Jesus Christ, it always is speaking of death. Sleep is, in, in, in Jesus thought of, of the death of Lazarus. He called it, he was asleep. All right. Then they which are fallen asleep, they which are, verse 18, they which are, are dead in Christ are perished. If Christ be not raised, we're in our sins. And not only that, death will have the dominion. Look at verse 19. Here's, listen to this. If in this life only, if just this life only, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. May I say this morning, if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, then death has the victor and the grave is final. And he listen to me, if death is the victor and the grave is final, then eternal life is nothing but a myth. That's all it is. That's all it is. If, if Christ be not risen, and the saddest part of all, if Christ be not risen, all up to this moment right now, if Christ be not risen, Every person who has died, they, have, they are perishing and their, their, their bodies are decaying in some grave somewhere. And Paul says, if that's true, if, that's, if that be the case, if that's all there is, then we are of all men most miserable. I can't think of anything in the world to be more miserable than not to have faith in that there's life after death. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'll tell you there. You see what I'm saying? Uh, listen to me. If in this life, that's all there is. God has given me some 86 years. I hope you'll give me a few more. But if this 86 years is all there is, and eventually I'm going to die, so are you. But if life here on earth is all there is, and the grave is the end of it all, hear me this morning, there is no hope whatsoever. And we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time being in church. We're wasting our time reading the Bible. We're wasting our time praying. We're wasting our time trying to live for Jesus. Because I want to tell you this morning, if in this life only, you, you just have faith in this life only, you're going to be miserable until the death on it. But praise God. Can I close with this? Woo! There's verse 20. <laughs> verse 20 is on the horizon. If there be no Christ, our message is meaningless. We have no meaning. If, there, if we be not risen from the dead, our faith doesn't mean a thing. If he's not risen from the dead, the, the gra uh, uh, death has a dominion. The grave is it. But I have the glorious privilege to stand before you this morning and say what Paul writes here in verse 20. Right? That's why I, don't, I get excited about it. Praise God this morning. It says, but now. Woo! But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Woo! And for as in Adam, yes, all of us are going to die if Jesus tarries. But listen to this. 
Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Can I say this morning, get excited about it? Can I praise God this morning? Death is not the end. The grave is not final. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why? Because my Savior 2,000 years ago this morning rose victorious from that grave. And hallelujah this morning. He is alive forevermore and at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. Whew. Oh, John in John 14, 19, Jesus says this, Wow, because I live, ye shall live also. But I want to also read, you know, we talk about the mandate uh, of the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. And that is a mandate. That is a great commission. A church that does not do that is failing God in that respect. But here's a man, I missed this. I, I, had, I had never seen this really in this light before. God gave us a mandate. And the mandate is associated with His resurrection. Turn, if you will, with me this morning to John uh, uh, chapter 11, please. John chapter 11. Here is a mandate, verses um, 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believeth, uh, uh, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou yet. What I'm saying is, this is what we are to preach. This is the reality. This is the hope. This is, I don't know what to say about it. This is our message. My message has a meaning because it's based and founded upon the fact that my Savior lives this morning. He is alive and well. Praise God for that on it. You see, in closing, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation. Brother Aaron talked about the rock being the foundation. He is the rock. And he's the living rock. Amen. And, he, and he's the foundation. He's the foundation of everything we stand for, everything we believe. So I can say to you this morning, the issue is not what if. That's not the issue. That was settled. <laughs> that was settled Sunday morning, 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem. That was settled. No, it's not what if. It's the settle is, but now. But now, but now, you see, because he rose from the dead, we have salvation and, for, and the forgiveness of our sin. Because he rose from the dead, we have a security and peace with God that the world knows nothing about. Because he rose from the dead, hallelujah, we have the surety of eternal life. I ask you this morning, on this beautiful resurrection morning, I would ask it if our church were full, do you know this living Christ as your Savior? Can you say with the Apostle Paul, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We sing the song, 
And we would have sung it this morning had we had church. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. I have no doubt that my Savior lives. I have no doubt that as He promised, one day I'm going to see Him again. I just ask this this morning. As he became a living reality in your life, have you personally repented of your sin and received him as your Lord and Savior? Folks, there's no salvation apart from it. I don't care what church you belong to. I don't care how many rituals you keep. I don't care how many prayers you say. I don't even care how much Bible you read. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you'll die and go to hell. Do you know the risen Christ this morning? Not just know about Him. There's a lot of th there's going to be a lot of preaching about Him this morning on the internet, and some churches do have service. A lot of preaching about Him, but do you know Him? Have you received Him? Have you accepted Him? And are you trusting Him this morning as your only Lord and Savior? And have you called upon Him and asked Him to come into your heart, forgive you of your sin, and tell Him you have received Him in the salvation of your soul? If you have not done that, I would beg you and plead with you. Call some Bible-believing preacher. Call me. Call Brother Aaron. Call Brother Dave Morris, our engineer. Call somebody. Get it settled. Because without you knowing the living Savior personally, one day you're going to die. You see, eternity is involved in this. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, I don't care what the seven-day Adventists tell you. I don't care what Jehovah's Witnesses tell you. You do, you do not go to sleep in the grave. The Bible says, the moment you close your eyes in death, you open them either in heaven or in hell. I can prove it, but I'm not have time for that. I'm just begging you this morning, if the risen, living, resurrected Christ is not your Savior, yes, Easter is bunnies, Easter is chicks, Easter is eggs, and Easter is a basket. But God help us if that's all it is then we are of all men most miserable. Would you bow your head with me? I'm not going to ask you to repeat a prayer. I'm not there with you. But I'm going to ask you yourself in your own way while I pray. If you're not saved, you do not know the Lord, the living Lord, the resurrected Lord, if you do not know Him as your Savior, would you right now on Resurrection Sunday, would you repent, confess, and believe and take Jesus as your Savior? Father, oh God, I pray this morning and somehow you'll take our messages, Brother Aaron, and, what, and my message. Somehow, God, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you reach out through the eons of, of, of the world and touch somebody's heart this morning. Oh, God, if they do not know Jesus, the resurrected living Christ, they have no hope 
whatsoever. There is no hope apart from Him. I pray that they might receive you today on this resurrected Sunday. They might get new life themselves as they would come to know the living Christ in a rea reality of who He is. Forgive us of our sin. I ask you to bless our people, though we cannot meet uh, together uh, uh, personally this morning. Our hearts are united by the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, you'll watch over our church as well as everyone else. I pray, God, that you'll give our great president the wisdom that he needs. Oh, God, he's under such a, such a stress. I pray for President Trump. I pray for our country. Our country is on the verge of collapsing, Lord. You know that. This thing, we, this could collapse. God, I pray there'll be enough of God's people to save it, to keep it from going under. I pray for my church. I pray for my people. I pray, God, you'll watch over and protect them and keep them. I pray quickly, God, you'll lead those who are in charge to get us out of this mess. You lead them. It will not be them doing it, but through God's leadership, they will do it. And I pray, God, you'll do that for us. Show mercy upon us. Oh, we're a wicked people. We're a godless people. We're a sinful people. But oh, God, they're still good people and righteous people and godly people. And I pray, Lord, I pray somehow you'll save America. I pray it. And thank you again. I praise you again. I glorify you again that I have a risen living Savior in whose name I pray. Amen. God bless you for listening to us. We'll be back on the air tonight at 6 o'clock. And if you need, need anything that we can do for you at any time, call us. Get a hold of us. Maybe when the thing over, you'll come visit Berean Baptist. We would love to see you. In the meantime, stay close to God. Stay safe. And be careful. God bless you. Amen.